Hello and welcome to the EMJ podcast with me, your host, Dr. Jonathan Sakia. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Kyle Richards, Associate Program Director and Associate Professor of Urology at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health in Madison in the good old US of A, an area of the country I know well. Uh, I need to ask him about ice fishing. Kyle obtained his bachelor's degree in biology and neuroscience from Carthage College in Kenosha, Wisconsin, remaining in that state his medical degree from the Medical College of Wisconsin. He then completed his internship and residency at Wake Forest Baptical Medical Center in Winston-Salem in North Carolina and fellowship in urologic oncology at the University of Chicago in Illinois. And he since specialized in cancers of the urinary system. He's an expert in both bladder and prostate cancers and performs innovative, minimally invasive surgical procedures for complex urologic cancers. Carl is also a leader in reconstructive urology for patients with neurogenic bladder and narrowed or blocked ureters. As a strong advocate for multidisciplinary patient-focused care, Kyle works alongside the radiology and pathology departments to develop comprehensive care plans tailored to each of his patients. And Kyle believes in patient education and empowerment and is dedicated to helping them understand their cancer and treatment options so that they can make informed decisions. Kyle's also an active member of the American Medical College Association, the American College of Surgeons, the Urological Society for American Veterans, an American Urologic Association, and has over 100 publications to his name. Outside of being a practicing urologist, Kyle enjoys spending time with his wife and two daughters who are 13 and 10 and enjoys music and playing the piano, reading historical fiction, and actually hosts his own podcasts, the WI or Winnovations podcast, and we'll put a link to that in our show notes, where he speaks with nationally recognized physicians from the University of Wisconsin Department of Urology about innovations in urologic research and treatment. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Kyle Richards. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you, Jonathan. That was uh, quite the in intro. I appreciate all that, all that at, uh, um, and uh, it's great to be here. Well, it's always good to set, the, set the, the tone so that people who are listening go, oh my God, this guy actually really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> um, so Kyle, I do want to ask you what initially drew you to the field of urologic oncology and what's kept you passionate about it for the years. But I mentioned in my introduction, we were talking before about your lovely state, which I, I encourage people to go visit. Although the winter time, I think, you know, there's Fahrenheit, Celsius and Kelvin, and then there's the Wisconsin temperature gauge. <laughs> I have never been so cold in my life as when I visited there in the winter. And I saw people ice fishing. For the benefit of those listening in who have no idea what ice fishing is, please tell them. Well, actually, uh, I've been ice fishing uh, many times before, and I t my daughters have, have not gone ice fishing yet because I'm not sure I want to. I want them to freeze uh, to death. <laughs> but the coldest, the coldest that I've ever been, and I'm a Wisconsinite, born and uh, raised, was ice fishing. And but essentially, you uh, the lakes. There's a plethora of lakes in the region. Uh, they freeze over completely uh, in the in the middle of winter, and uh, people find it entertaining to drill a hole um in in the in the in the ice and sometimes the ice is a foot or sometimes two feet deep thick um so they you know you use an auger and you drill a hole some of these are electric augers um or uh gas powered augers to get through that ice and then you stand over this hole with a little fishing pole and and and, and wait for a bite and you also sit in like little huts, some of which are quite sophisticated and have beds and televisions and, and drink <laughs> so, beer. And so the more, yeah, the more advanced uh, fisher folks uh, buy these uh, huts or shanties, we call them. Um, and uh, you sit in there, you have a heat, little, maybe a little heater. And uh, there, there's definitely a fair amount of uh, beer guzzling that happens uh, during this uh, to, to, to stay warm, of course. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It, 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 it's one of the things of living in America I could never get my head around. Anyway, urology, what, what got you into urologic oncology and what's kept you passionate about it over the years? Well, when I was starting my uh, training at Wake Forest in 2007, uh, in the U.S., robotic surgery was really starting to 
to uh, take off. Uh, and urologists were, were, were very early adopters of many technologies, lasers, uh, minimally invasive surgery. Urologists historically were early adopters of these technologies. And that's what initially drew me to urology was just the fascination of, of advancing the field through technological innovations. And that's partly, I guess, you know, now I host a, a podcast of my own called Winnovations, where we talk about a lot of the innovative things that, that we're doing in urology. And the thing that's kept me going since then and how I've shifted my focus now to urologic oncology was not just the technology, but also the ability to forge relationships with patients. So urologists are surgeons, but we also treat patients medically. And then we've, not only do we diagnose their cancers, we follow them longitudinally, we treat their cancers, and then we are responsible largely for their their long-term follow-up. We call it their survivorship. So I've been in practice now for 10 years, and I have patients that I have now seen for for 10 years uh, because they need their ongoing surveillance and survivorship. So I, I enjoy that sort of relational aspect. It's not just you know, do a surgery, never see a patient back again, or maybe see them back once. I, I get to know them. They get to know me. They come to clinic, ask about my kids, my wife. You know, it's 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 what keeps me kind of fulfilled in this sort of era of burnout in, in, in medicine, I think, is these these really good relationships that you can forge with patients has really kept me going. Yeah, in fact, um, I'm, I'm a bit of a naysayer about the whole, whole burnout thing. Um, I think we're the most privileged people on the planet practicing medicine because the relationships you can have with people are so rewarding. And the, it's such a privilege to be involved in people's life at the most vulnerable time in their life. So, yeah, I'm with you on that. I know that you're a big advocate for a patient education, comprehensive cares, led to presentations, papers, awards, and you're a reviewer for an award in this area. So what strategies do you use to ensure your patients are well informed about their cancer and treatment options and why it's so critical? This is the sort of thing I think people pay a lot of lip service to. So tell us what's different about your philosophy. Yeah, I think um, when I see patients that have uh, bladder cancer, for example, and then we start talking about, you know, not, you know, it's a big shock, first off, to for most people to be diagnosed with a with a cancer, and a bladder cancer can you can go multiple directions, but a lot of the patients that get referred to me are ultimately being sent for surgery to, to have their bladders removed, and if you think about having on having your bladder removed and then having some sort of a reconstruction to rebuild a bladder or to have a you know urostomy or or the multitude of options that we can offer patients. It's uh, for patients, it's like drinking. I use the analogy. It's like drinking out of a fire hydrant. It's information overload. It's shock to the system. And I think a lot of the complex, it doesn't have to just be your logic, but even some of the complex medical conditions that we treat, um, I, I, it's like information overload. And patients, there's been a lot of good studies, good research that has showed that patients that are better informed, that are better educated, have better outcomes, whether it be surgical or they adhere to their medication regimen. If they understand why and, and they can grasp that, then they have fewer complications after surgery, shorter hospital stay. So we've we've built a sort of a comprehensive program to try to address that. I've I've actually had focus groups with patients. Because I think it's it's not just you know what I think it's what what do the patients think and patients have told us that uh, in in our focus groups that we need to do a better job educating them uh, because of the information overload. So we've developed a very you know specific handouts that I give patients. We're working with um, some uh, um, other uh, developers to um, there's a there's a program called Well Prepped. Um, 
so you can you can check that one out it's uh it's basically where you can build your own website and then this company well prepped helps you to build it and then patients can go to that site prior to their office visit so they have a they're coming to see me for bladder cancer i can send them a link to the the website they can actually prepare ahead of time and there's you can put videos on there so i think we need to do a better job as a as a medical community in in coming up with strategies to educate patients so that they can be more prepared and then hopefully have better outcomes. Yeah, it's about trust. Um, right? If they if they view their physician as truly being on their journey with them and not being a just a vendor who's providing them a service, but as someone who, you know, sometimes I remember being taught that the um, uh, sometimes the best thing you can do for a patient is just the way you talk to them, just the way you... Where, how you position your chair when you're sitting next to them, rather than being sort of this sort of professorial distance across a desk, just put the chair side by side and touch the benefit of just physical touch, putting your hand on someone's arm and saying, it's okay, I know this is complicated, but you know I'm going to help you through this and being all available. So let's put a link to that in, in show notes so people can access that. But changing the subject a wee bit, I, I was fascinated by this. You authored a paper that looked at whether the infamous Vietnam era defoliant, Agent Orange, that they, they would spray to basically get rid of the jungle so that they could see the enemy combatants, whether Agent Orange played a role in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer outcomes. Um, I believe it didn't prove to be so, but as an expert on possible carcinogenic effects of environmental exposure, uh, just briefly tell us about Agent Orange, for those who don't know about it, and what are some of the other likely etiologies? I seem to remember dyes, aniline dyes, wasn't it, back in the day? Were, were... Yeah, Jonathan, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, aniline dyes, um, any, anything that has aromatic hydrocarbons in it are... Uh, risk factors are known known uh, occupational hazards for uh, bladder cancer specifically, and you know we've already touched on you know one of my passions of in academia, which is patient education research, and and the other is uh, environmental exposure. There is a very I, I would say I'm I'm part of the growing movement of folks that are interested in environmental exposures. We've done a lot of things to our environments that are not good. Um, let's be frank. Um, at least, and in, in, I can say that's true in the United States, where um, we have issues with pesticides getting into into drinking water um, and into the soil. And um, the Agent Orange story is really fascinating because, as you alluded to, it was used as a defoliant uh, in Korea as well as the Vietnam Wars. Uh, so that the jungle could be essentially cleared, uh, so that the soldiers could come in and and uh, and do their do their job, so to speak. And there is a, a a carcinogen in that um, in that defoliant, which is named Agent Orange. And uh, and we we do know that it is a risk factor for several uh, cancers. Prostate cancer is a big one. Um, and then recently, uh, bladder cancer has also been added to the list of, uh, of cancers that is associated and likely caused by Agent Orange. Um, and we, we actually, for the research you alluded to, Jonathan, asked a question, is a very specific question, what, because veterans are concerned if they had this exposure, would it cause, uh, would it alter the biology of their cancer? Would it make their outcomes worse? So that was this, really the specific question that we wanted to answer that we were hearing from our own patients. And we did an observational study. Obviously, you can't do a you know, randomized controlled trial to, to test this hypothesis, but we were able to look back uh, and compare veterans that had an exposure to veterans that did not using our administrative data sets. And fortunately, we did not see a difference in outcomes uh, in their uh, cancer outcomes. So whether you had an exposure or not did not lead to worse outcomes. And I think that's reassuring for the patients that had had exposures is that we don't have to necessarily treat them any differently. Their cancer is not more aggressive than if they didn't have an exposure. And that information is useful for for providers because we don't have to alter the way that we manage these patients. Um, but we are 
we have ongoing studies uh, right now where we're looking at other um, environmental exposures. There's in Wisconsin, there's um, uh, been a, 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 we're looking at arsenic. Uh, arsenic is also a carcinogen that we've, we've actually found in, um, uh, it, that gets into the soil. And um, we did a recent uh, study that hasn't been published yet, but we, we were actually able to find higher levels of arsenic in the homes of patients with bladder cancer than in patients that did not have bladder cancer, uh, sort of control in our control group. So really interesting stuff and, and more to come. That's, um, of, of course, um, causation is, is proving causation is important. Is it coincidence or is it causation? But uh, watch this space and we'll look out for that paper. Um, and if it's published by the time the podcast comes out, then we'll put a link to it in the show notes, the aforementioned show notes. So Perfect. you provided um, an editorial comment on a paper entitled The Multicenter Prospective Randomized Control Trial Comparing Catablancer, Catablancer? I mean, that's similar to bladder cancer and it's slightly different, uh, with the speech defect, bladder cancer triage to cystoscopy in patients with microhematuria the safe testing of risk for asymptomatic micro uh, hematuria trial or strata trial. Talk to us about screening for bladder cancer, the role of uh, urinary genomics and good old fashioned dipsticks for red blood cells. I believe the genomic test can reduce unnecessary cystoscopy, for instance. And I know you've also been involved in writing guidelines for this. So a bit of a mouthful, but take it away. Right. Yeah. No, it's an important area of ongoing study, Jonathan, because uh, uro- urologists, um, we do, I do about 500 cystoscopies a, a year for patients that have either blood in the urine or they're, they're undergoing bladder cancer surveillance. Mm-hmm. So it's a, and that's just me doing 500, cyst- you know, cystoscopies a year. These are invasive procedures. They're, they're done with the, an awake patient where a, a scope is inserted in, in through their urethra into the bladder. So it's, it's an invasive procedure. Um, and if you look across the U, US of A, there are millions of these you know, procedures done annually. So the idea is, is, there's, is there any way that we can develop a less, you know, lesser invasive testing to decrease these procedures? Because of that, the vast majority of these procedures we as urologists, we don't find anything actionable, which is good for the patient, right? Because if, if you're sta- if you're the one sit you know laying there on the on the gurney, I, I think you hope that I don't find anything. Uh, but the idea there is, could we have a less invasive test to decrease the frequency of these procedures? And and folks have been trying to develop these genomic uh, urine-based tests. So essentially, instead of having an invasive procedure. If you have blood in your urine, you could urinate, you know, give us a urine specimen. We could look at that urine specimen um, uh, in the lab to see if it, it has a, a genetic or a genomic signature that predicts a higher chance that maybe you do have a bladder tumor that we would then need to act on. Um, so the so that's where there's a lot of ongoing studies looking at the, trying to find really the, the best test. Um, and, and the one that I wrote the editorial on, turned out to be a pretty good test. Now they have to, these folks have to do more research to make sure that it's uh, accurate and that it it, uh, is reproducible in other settings, but it it does hold promise because one of the issues that we face um, here in the U.S., I don't know if it's the same, uh, I think it's probably similar in other, other places as well, is that we don't have enough space. We don't have enough resources. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough, you know, resources to meet the demand of our aging patient population. So by doing these urine-based testing, that frees up space and potentially decreases the amount of unnecessary procedures that we're doing. Yeah, so I think you'll find um, that it's exactly the same elsewhere. And uh, there was a friend of mine who, who said to me a number of years ago, a very prominent British uh, uh, physician, surgeon, um, he said that the only difference between the British and the American healthcare systems is the British are bankrupt and know it, and the Americans are bankrupt and haven't figured it out yet. But I'm afraid that the Americans are now figuring it out. I've practiced on both sides of the Atlantic, and other than 
you know, some things like calling it the operating room versus the operating theater. I found my practice there to be remarkably similar to, uh, to over here. Um, I think we've, there are far more uh, things in common uh, than, than separate. BCG, Bacillus calmet guerin used to vaccinate against tuberculosis, of course. Whilst most of our audience are healthcare practitioners, we do have some lay listeners, um, citizen scientists, if you will. So please give us the current understanding of the role of BCG in bladder cancer. Yeah, the, the, I'm glad you asked, Jonathan, because the, the BCG story is really quite fascinating, something I've been very interested in since I've been uh, in medicine. And BCG was, as you alluded to, it's a, it's a vaccine for tuberculosis, and it's still used uh, all over the world uh, for that purpose. Uh, but it, it started to be, um, it was studied for, you know, as a potential immunotherapy for other cancers, uh, if you look at its history uh, over the course of the past hundred years, um, they looked at it for melanoma. Didn't really work well for melanoma. They looked at it for, um, you know, breast cancer and some other malignancies. And and then finally, um, it seemed to, it's it, it sort of fell into the urologist's uh, lap. Um, and uh, Alvaro Morales, uh, a, a urologist. Uh, started to study it in, in, in his lab and, and found that it was very, um, that bladder cancer seemed to be a hit. Um, and that was in the, the 80s, um, 1980s. And then in 1990, uh, BCG was uh, FDA approved for the treatment of non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So early stage bladder cancer. Um, and it, uh, it's a form of immunotherapy. So it doesn't, um, actually kill cancer cells, but it's, it's the way I describe it to patients. And so for the lay listeners is it stimulates the body's immune system, uh, to essentially go to the bladder and, and kill any cancer cells that might be forming. Now there are, are some more complex mechanistic, uh, theories that are out there. Nobody knows exactly how BCG works, which is also kind of fascinating. The exact etiology or the ex exact mechanism of action is, is, is still largely, I would say theoretical, um, and it's the most commonly used medication around the world for early stage bladder cancer. Now we've we're we've had issues um, with a worldwide BCG shortage, uh, off and on for the past uh, ten years or so. So the the search is on for other drugs to um, compete with BCG. Uh, we still don't um, have really good data um, where there's ongoing trials. There's a trial right now called the bridge trial, which we're part of here at university of Wisconsin, where we're randomizing patients to BCG versus intravesical chemotherapy um, to try to, you know, head to head, see if, uh, if one is better than the other. Um, there's some retrospective data suggesting that chemotherapy um, may be as good as uh, BCG. So more, more to come on that, but it's, um, the reason for the shortage is, is it's a difficult drug to manufacture. Uh, so the, the drug industry has, um, ha, you know, a lot of the manufacturers have actually dropped out. In the U.S., there's only one manufacturer right now. It's being manufactured by Merck, so big pharma. Um, and uh, it's, it's not really one that's cost effective for a lot of these drug companies to manufacture. So that's led to some of the issues with the shortage. Yeah. Yeah, um, we're seeing more and more of these sort of things uh, coming about with 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 other drugs. Uh, something I'm hearing more and more about, and diagnostics and diagnostic uh, media and medical devices. Uh, it's you know many many problems. So we hear a lot about prostate cancer screening, and as a gentleman of a certain age, uh, it's of interest to me. I've had a number of my very dear friends diagnosed and 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 looked after on both sides of the duck pond. And we've discussed bladder cancer today, but what about the sequelae for men treated for these conditions in the face of a neurogenic bladder? Yeah, and it, uh, just to put a plug in, it's Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. So thank you for doing that, Jonathan. Thank, um, I am very interested in, in prostate cancer as well as bladder cancer. And uh, it's, uh, you know, prostate cancer can be diagnosed via screening. It's one of the cancers that we do have reliable screening tests for 
PSA, uh, prostate specific antigen, is a blood test that we can use to screen for prostate cancer. It has gotten a little bit of a bad rap over the years because of the issue with over detection and over diagnosis of prostate cancer, which subsequently leads to over treatment. Uh, however, I think we shouldn't blame PSA for that. We should be more, I would say, cautious with when men are diagnosed with prostate cancer, we should be more pragmatic with how they're treated. In patients with neurogenic bladder, um, we wrote a recent uh, review article on the topic uh, that looked at this question. I think the big issue is a lot of these patients with neurogenic bladder have either a chronic catheter or they have to self-catheterize to empty their bladder. In anybody that has to do uh, do that, do that, whether they have a neurogenic bladder or not, or if they just have had a catheter inserted, that can cause the PSA to be artificially elevated from inflammation of the prostate. So any sort of condition or situation that would lead to inflammation of the prostate could cause the PSA to be artificially elevated. And that can be confusing for providers to interpret. So it's just something to be aware of if you're taking care of these patients. You should still, you know, cons you know, discuss with them about screening for prostate cancer, but the interpretation of the PSA is a bit more nuanced. Yeah, yeah. And your point about overtreatment is key. Um, obviously, you have to take into consideration the patient's age, um, their comorbid conditions, their risk of the cancer ending their life prematurely. Um, so. As you say, it's nuanced, and yeah, you shouldn't blame the screening test. But uh, um, you know, you get the sense when you're talking to someone who's who's actually got a level head on their shoulders. So thank you for saying that. So um, changing topics, and and uh, I this is a condition I've only ever seen once in my career, mind you. I'm not a urologist, but only come across it once. You've served as a panelist for the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guidelines Committee on penile cancer. It's not an, it's, this isn't something that's often discussed. How common is it and what is being done to educate men about risks? We've talked about patient empowerment, uh, screening and treatment options. Um, my guess is that most men would be absolutely terrified by this diagnosis. Yeah, I'm on the on the uh, NCCN guidelines for, for penile cancer. And it, the good news, Jonathan, is it's a rare cancer. So not, not one that we see very often. In fact, in, in, in my practice, I, I probably see, uh, and, and I'm a fairly busy clinician in addition to my research and my administrative duties, I probably see five n men a year that are newly diagnosed with penile cancer. And they all, oftentimes they get referred in because of it being a rare diagnosis. Most of our community urologists aren't going to feel very comfortable managing it. So they get referred in. So it's, it's uh, it, in most Western countries, it's rare. We do see it pop up a little bit more frequently in some parts of South America, as well as um, some some parts of Africa have higher rates of penile cancer. Uh, some of it has to do with uh, um, two things. Um, uncircum uncircumcised status is an increased risk, and as well as poor hygiene. So if you don't have access to running water where you can bathe frequently and, and clean the, uh, the prepucial area, that does pose an increased risk of penile cancer. Many of the men that I see in the U.S., they tend to be uncircumcised, older men. Smoking is a risk factor as well. And many times they're ashamed. Like they know that there is a lesion there that's been there for a while, and they're just embarrassed and ashamed to seek care. So I think the message to clinicians out there, you know, that might 
you know, primary care providers or even patients that might be tuning in is if you see a spot on, on your on your penis, it's not normal to have you know, a growth there. Get it checked out sooner rather than later, because many of the men, by the time they come to see me, it's gotten to be you know, quite large to the point where they're having a hard time urinating. You know, it's it's replacing a, a significant portion of their penis. If it's picked up earlier, it's a bit easier to treat. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So I think we do have to get the word out there um, to get these patients in sooner so that it can be managed a little bit, hopefully easier. Yeah, yeah. So as I say, I've only seen it once um, in, in my career. So you're actively involved in researching new treatment approaches for any of the uro- urologic cancers. Can you discuss some of the lo- latest or most exciting uh, advancements in the field of prostate and bladder cancer therapies? And what promise do, for instance, targeted alpha therapies, TAT, hold? It's a terrible acronym, isn't it? TAT. <laughs> TAT. Over here, TAT means something not terribly interesting and kind of inexpensive and poor quality. But And that's <laughs> the very opposite of what this is. I presume the multidisciplinary team approach is foundation for modern urology urologic oncology as it is for other branches of oncology so yeah have at it yeah you know i i'm going to actually take this in the direction of of sort of systemic therapies for bladder cancer specifically because i to me that's really been some of the most exciting areas of advancing that we've had in the past five years are in the systemic therapies for bladder cancer. I know the European Society of Medical Oncology is meeting right now. Uh, in their annual meeting is a year ago, there was a, a really fantastic presentation about um, using a combination of drugs called enfortimab, vedotin, and pembrolizumab uh, for advanced bladder cancer. Traditionally, these patients really only had one option, and that was cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And this presentation last year at ESMO showed a a very impressive improvement in survival in patients that received EV Pembro over standard cisplatin-based chemotherapy. It's the first time that we've ever seen any sort of drug outdo cisplatin-based chemotherapy. So This uh, combination therapy that we're seeing with uh, EV Pembro for uh, advanced bladder cancer has been quite impressive. And then there's some newer targeted therapies in the space. There's a drug called Ertafitinib that um, targets the FGFR receptor. Um, There's a drug called Sazitizumab that um, also is a is a targeted based therapy where they're actually able to use monoclonal antibodies to get the drug into the cancer cell so that you have fewer collateral damage. Uh, so really, it's it's really an exciting time to take care of patients with bladder cancer because we have more to offer um, than what we had five or 10 years ago. We, we didn't really see any advancements for probably 20 years in the in, in the systemic therapy space for bladder cancer. And now we have four or five new options for patients that are good options uh, that are extending people's lives and even providing potential cures. So in 2019, you were named as one of 26 doctors to follow on Twitter. I actually only recently got myself some social media accounts and I'm tentatively exploring it. And as we mentioned, you host your own podcast, the Winnovations podcast. Can you give us your thoughts about the role of physician-led social media activities like this podcast, your podcast, Twitter, so on and so forth? I think it's a a great way to connect with other physicians within your field and and outside. And I've actually met a lot of people through social media that I maybe wouldn't have met in real life. And then when I get to meet them in real life, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I I know you from from Twitter or from this or from that. And they're like, you know, so it's kind of, it, it's been really a, a great way to network and expand your network. Um, I think it's a good way to promote uh, work that's being done uh, within your own institution or, or colleagues or friends from around the globe. Um, and then the third thing I'll say to that, Jonathan, is it's a, it's a great way to learn. I have learned so much um, from I, I sort of call it the Euro 
or the medical Twitterverse. You know, I don't try to get go down certain other pathways. I try to stick to sort of the medical side of things. And I've learned a tremendous amount from being involved and engaged in social media, uh, things that I, I probably wouldn't have learned. You know, I people are always posting their, you know, papers and, and abstracts from meetings. Like I can like, I'm not in Europe right now, but I know what's going on at 2024 ESMO because people are posting it on Twitter and I can follow along. If something's interesting, I can pin it. I can get the publication and print it out or save it to my files. So I learn about things in real time. And, uh, you know, there's always that sort of fear of missing out of certain, you know, the FOMO. Um, I try to not have that, but I, I can still sort of participate in some of these meetings that I can't travel to. Right, right. Yeah, well, I, I guess I raise it because when responsible people do it, it's a um, an antidote to the nonsense that's out there. I mean, I'm, I keep going off on these, um, these sort of curmudgeonly rants <laughs> against people peddling pseudoscience or basically using uh, social media for financial gain. Uh, I, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with, I, I'm a capitalist, go for it, but, but not when you're leveraging pseudoscience or, or fake news. It's just... Yeah, you got to weed through some of that. And I think, you know, you have to be very sort of careful with, um, you know, who you're sort of following and, you know, so yeah, there is some of that, Jonathan, that kind of you got to weed through. Um, but I think it's, I've stuck through it. Um, I've been, I think I I started to get involved maybe about nine or 10 years ago. Um, and it's, uh, I've, I've stuck it out. I know there are some people that have left social media because of the points that you brought up. Uh, but I, I still continue, as long as I'm continuing to make connections, meaningful connections and learn mm -hmm. and, and not be discouraged, I'm going to stick with it. And, and that's where I'm at today. One of the things that I learned in my little experiments with social media is that you'll get people who will post things that are vindictive or nonsensical. And I thought, oh, crap, I'm going to have to deal with that now. And I have to respond. And say, no, 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 no. The community will take care of it. Just relax, chill out. And lo and behold, people are like, yeah, dude, you're out of order here. <laughs> so there you go. So finally, I've got a question I like to ask everyone that if a magic genie, if you were out ice fishing and instead of catching a fish, by the way, good on you for not uh, submitting your, your children to ice fishing. <laughs> That's cruel and unusual. <laughs> um, if you could, if you caught yourself a genie instead of a fish who granted you three wishes in your area of healthcare, what might those wishes be, Kyle? That's pretty funny, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> so I would, uh, the first wish would be for more space. We, we sort of alluded to that earlier, that uh, space is at a premium. Uh, we don't have enough clinic space. We, we sort of lack in, uh, uh, I mean, there's construction going on right outside my window, but they can't seem to build it fast enough. Uh, the second would be, actually, we didn't touch on this, but as a surgeon, this is really important. We need more anesthesiologists, more, you know, gas passers, as we call them, mm -hmm. <laughs> because uh, we can't operate if we don't have a, a, an anesthesia team. And, and right now in the U.S., we have a, a very significant shortage of anesthesia providers. Um, and then the third thing would be actually probably more resources for clinical trials, uh, which we sort of alluded on. I think for us to advance the field, whatever field we're in, we have to do high quality clinical trials. Clinical trials can be quite expensive. They can also take up space because you need space for, you know, patients that are enrolling in clinical trials, but we need more resources, clinical research assistance, all of, you know, money, whatever it might be to conduct high quality clinical trials. Cause those are th at that level, that of, of research, that's where we can really move our fields forward. Yeah. Those, those are good observations. Um, Certainly, it, it's in my professional lifetime. It's become harder and harder and harder to do uh, to do meaningful research, clinical research. So, yep. Um, so, get yourself out ice fishing and catch yourself <laughs> that that uh, that cheesy pile. Well, the winter's almost here in Wisconsin. I'm yeah. sure uh, you know next week it'll be back down to you know 
below zero. <laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah, but again, for the benefit of people listening in, the state actually does have some some wonderful places to visit. Um, so uh, sadly, that's all we've got time for uh, today. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Carl Richards, uh, for being with us today. Real pleasure to to chat with you. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure and uh, I look forward to maybe coming back and we can talk again. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, folks, um, please uh, consider subscribing on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, leave reviews, likes, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, check out the archives. There's hundreds of episodes uh, on there. And please join us next week for another fascinating episode. Until then, I'm Dr. Jonathan Sakira, proud to serve as your host, and I thank you for listening to the EMJ podcast. Until next time, everyone, please stay safe, stay well, stay curious. Bye for now. 